Uh, sure. Yep. You can get and started. Michael, you're ready to get started as well. Yeah. Um, okay. For everybody online, thank you so much for being here. My name is Cinnamon Moffitt. I'm the research program manager at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center, located in Newport, Oregon. I will be your host for today's talk. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know that we have disabled your mics, camera, and screen shares for this particular talk, but we would love it if you put any of your questions into the chat box and we'll work through those questions at the end of today's presentation. I also wanted to let folks know if they need live captioning that has been activated so you can go ahead and click the button at the bottom and you can get a live captioning for you if that is helpful. Um, also, just a heads up, we are recording today's presentation. It will be posted on the past seminar page in a few days. Um, I just going to put that link into the chat box. So if you want to share today's presentation with somebody else or you'd like to watch parts of it again, you'll be able to do that probably on well, holiday, probably Tuesday, if I'm being honest on how long it'll take me to get that going. Want to just do a really quick announcement for next week. Um, I'm having a little bit of shock. It is June 2nd is next week's seminar. Um, I don't know how June came so quickly, but we have Roy Lowe, who's the former reserves manager that used to be stationed here at Hatfield for US Fish and Wildlife. We'll be talking about monitoring migratory birds in Lincoln County through citizen science. So I'm excited to see what Roy has to bring back to us. Um, it's been a little while since we've heard him talk, so it'll be nice to have him with us. Um, this will be a high hybrid event again, so that means there will be remote and on-site options in the Marine Studies Building Auditorium. Everyone is welcome to attend, and because there's no food or drink allowed in the auditorium, there will be a cookie and coffee social before the talk from 3 to 3.30. Just bring your own mug and uh, get some coffee and get some sweets and then come um, and hear about migratory birds. Um, if you want to learn a little bit more about any of Hatfield's events, you're welcome to go to HMSC's homepage, scroll to the bottom of that page. There'll be a calendar of events there with login information for all of the talks that we do, either our Thursday seminars or upcoming other events. But for today, we're really excited to have today's speaker. Um, and uh, Michael Banks is the one that uh, was in instrumental in bringing Will to us. So I'm going to actually hand this off to Michael to introduce today's speaker. Michael. Hello, everybody. It's my great joy to introduce uh, William uh, Hemstrong to us as the seminar speaker for today. I first met Will about 10 years ago as a bright-eyed uh, honors college undergraduate student who came to uh, join our study uh, of LC River Steelhead associated with the Oregon Hatchery Research Center. And Will is now in his final term as a PhD candidate in ecology at the University of California, Davis, uh, with actually his defense scheduled at noon tomorrow. So uh, we, <laughs> we wish him well with that. He previously, after that undergraduate experience, he joined our lab for a master's degree um, where he studied the genetics of three introduced uh, spined stickleback in the Deschutes River and the genetic impact of a barrier removal uh, up upon summer steelhead in the Siletz River. His PhD focuses on the genetics of migration in monarchs and salmonids and on using quantitative and population genetics alongside machine learning to better predict species response to environmental change. And so uh, thank you, Will, for joining us and over to you. Thanks for the introduction, Michael. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, coming here to you on a nice low stress week where I've made the excellent life decision of preparing two 40 minute talks on slightly different material one day after the other. Um, so we'll see how this goes today. <clears throat> but I think this is a really interesting topic. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, the genetics of migration and kind of comparing and contrasting um, how the decision to migrate is controlled between monarch butterflies, actually monarch butterflies in Australia specifically, and um, between Masu and steelhead salmon. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started here. First off, it's important to note that migratory taxa are not doing well in general across a huge taxonomic range. So in, uh, in uh, diadromous fish here in, in North America and elsewhere, 
there's been pretty steep declines in a lot of tax over the last 150 or so years. Um, it's very pronounced and it's, it's more pronounced in migrants than in non-migratory fish species. And this is true for birds as well. This paper here found that something like 44 out of 60 different uh, migratory birds, neotropic migrants in, in North America had declined, which is a lot more than we saw in non-migrants. Um, it's also true in insects. So this is from monarch butterflies, may, one of the main topics of the, of the uh, discussion today. And they've declined radically as well. And note that this plot is a little bit misleading. On the y-axis here, we have numbers in millions. So we have 0.01 uh, and 3 million. So the scale is not consistent here. So we go from a population of you know, 3 million or so monarchs. And this is just in Western North America, uh, the ones that uh, hang out down in California. And we have declined to just over 100,000 <laughs> since 1980 alone. Um, we had a really good year for them last year, but I don't expect that to hold up. Um, we're still not 100% sure why that year was so good, um, but I don't expect that that trend is going to continue. I expect that we'll keep having really small numbers every year. So they're really in pretty bad shape. And why are they so much worse than um, the non-migratory species is a really good question. And it's it's the reasons seem pretty similar, right? So land use, ecological changes, hydrological modif modifications, climate change, uh, uh, phenological mismatches is a big one. So as climate change changes the timing of resource availability, uh, organisms have to change their life history timing to match that uh, in order to take advantage of resources at the right time. Um, and other kinds of ecological changes that come along with climate change, which are uh, pretty vast. Um, and especially in fish, stuff like over exploitation. Um, these things all apply to non-migratory taxa too. Land use, climate change, overexploitation. We don't only have those problems in migratory species, we have them in non-migratory ones as well. So why though is it so much worse on migrants? Well, remember that for migratory species, so this here is massive salmon, um, which like most salmon species have a um, variable life history where they uh, spend their uh, youth in the rivers, go to the seas to mature and then come back to the rivers to breed. And in this case is these impacts can happen when they're in the ocean, they can happen when they're in the river, and they can happen during that transition period between the two. Uh, we put dams up in rivers, those hydrological modifications can stop the transition, even if the ocean and river are good. And so as a result, they tend to be more prone to problems because maybe your river conditions are excellent for steelhead, but if the ocean is in really bad shape where these are trying to go to grow, you're not gonna have steelhead do well. Or maybe the ocean is in really good shape, but the river is uh, heavily um, disturbed. So our migrant tax, they have to deal with all changes across a much wider spatial scale. Um, and that can cause severe problems for them. And this is on top of the fact that migrants already have to put out an immense amount of meta uh, uh, metabolic activity in order to complete their migration. So maybe it's not too surprising that they are in such a problem. There's these multiple impacts, impact points. So what might we expect to happen then? And note that in this diagram, we see that there's actually a different life history option for these masu where they can become precocial and not go to the ocean. They can reproduce in rivers without ever doing that. They can be what we call residents. Um, what we should select then expect is if there's impacts happening at all these places, we might expect to see that selection is acting uh, more strongly against migration, and we should start to favor those non-migrants. Because in so doing, impacts to the transition areas and the sea no longer are a problem if you don't ever go to those areas. Um, and so we should expect to see these kinds of decline in the proportion of individuals that are migratory whenever we have populations that have the option to not be migratory. And that is actually what we see in a lot of taxa. So here's just one example from uh, migratory birds. These are from Eurasian black caps, a really awesome study that's been running for a long time. And they found a significant and substantial and consistent decline in the amount of migratory activity in their populations over the last couple of decades. Um, with their modeling predicting that we will see pretty much the extirpation of migratory behavior in these individuals over the next 100 years or so. This gives us this, this term of quasi-extinction. It's the population itself doesn't go extinct, but we lose one segment of its life history. Um, and maybe in those black caps that'll happen when they don't migrate anymore. Um, and this is caused basically by growth rates or fitness of migratory individuals to be you know, uh, declining, which leads to the population declines in those migratory individuals. 
Uh, suffice it to say, this is a problem. It's ecologically troublesome if we lose those migratory uh, behaviors. For example, salmonids bring lots of resources from oceanic environments back to freshwater environments, and monarch butterflies are important uh, pollinators in the areas that they go to, as well as being important prey species. Um, so losing that will damage those ecosystems. And also, I mean, I don't know about you, but I think the world is much more interesting when we have migratory taxa, when there's some change season to season in the species that are around us, and especially in monarch butterflies, which are so charismatic and well-known, losing that migration would be a real tragedy. Um, which then gives us the question, if we're in this scenario, we've lost migration, we shouldn't expect that selection always acts against migration. We should expect that if we manage to improve things, if we actually help you know, reduce our emissions and see things improve in the future, maybe the selection gradient will change and suddenly being a migrant will be fit again. The question is, if that happens, can we get back what we've lost? Can we get this migratory life history back in populations that used to have it? Um, so to talk about that, I think one of the first things to talk about is selection against migration and where that acts. So one way that you can kind of divide your migratory genes, the genetics that enable migration, is into two categories. One is migration decision genes. These are the genes that say, as an individual, do I choose to migrate or not? Am I a resident or am I a naturalist? Am I resident or migratory? These are things like migratory cue reception, picking up that, oh, the data lengths are declining. It's time to leave North America and, and fly down to South America. Um, or things that are like time to leave genes. Genes that actually say, okay, you picked up the queue, let's go. Or you picked up the, the queue, we're gonna stay anyway. So these kinds of genes are those decision genes, but there's also enabling genes. These are the genes that allow you to migrate if you've made that decision. That's stuff like orientation, lipid storage and metabolism, these other kinds of genes that really, really help you out if you're gonna migrate, but they don't tell you to migrate per se. So selection against migration, we should definitely expect to happen on those migratory decision genes. Um, if it is more fit to be a resident than a migrant, um, selection should favor those genes that say don't migrate. It should favor broken migratory cue receptions that never give you the cues to migrate and time to leave genes that say stay here. We shouldn't expect selection to ever act against these migratory enabling genes because if an individual does decide to migrate, it's always going to be more fit if it does that migration, migration better. Right? So selection will favor you to not migrate, but if you do choose to migrate anyway, selection should favor you to be the best migrant you can. So we should see selection favoring activity against these migratory decision genes. And so even though this is a really important part of the overall picture of migration, in this talk, I'm going to favor, I'm going to focus on migratory decision genes. Um, so an individual's phenotype, that is in this case, the decision to migrate or not, we can kind of um, explain how the different components um, of the individual feed into that phenotype using what we call the animal model. So this is that your phenotype is equal to your genotype plus your environment. So your phenotype is equal to the genetics that you have and then also contributed by some environmental effects. So if we were talking in a completely different field and we looked at how big is my cow, the cow's size is the phenotype, the genotype is the growth rate genes and other things like that that determine the growth rate of that cow. And the environment is, did we feed the cow? All these things play into how big the cow is. And we can use that same model to explore migration. How does the genotype and environment determine if an individual migrates or not? So let's examine two extreme scenarios. First, let's say first we have a case where the decision to migrate is entirely driven by environmental factors. In a scenario like this, if we've lost migration um, and scenarios shift to favor migration again, there should be no problem with migrants coming back. Uh, those decision genes don't exist. There's no decision genes that say, do we migrate or not? Uh, maybe the enabling ones are there, but no decision things. And so there's nothing to lose in this context. Um, as the environmental conditions change back to normal, the migrants will survive again and we'll start to see them again. Um, on the other hand, if we're in a scenario where uh, all of the phenotype of migration is decided by genetics with no environmental impacts, it gets much more complicated. Um, it's much more difficult to predict, should we recover migratory behavior? And of course, no, this is all a gross simplification. Um, a more complex model would also include interactions between genetic and environment, genes and environment that all play into this as well. Uh, but from a simplistic point of view, if there's a genetic effect on migration only, it's more tricky to tell if we would recover migratory behavior. Um, so to explore this a little bit more, let's take a look at these two different kind of models for the genetics that underlie migration. 
Uh, the first is a threshold model. This is something that's been put forward by Francesca Polito over the last 20 years or so. And basically it says that we can treat migration, which is a discrete trait with two categories, your resident or your migrant. We can treat this as if it was a continuous trait by looking at an individual's propensity to migrate. Um, so we basically say, let's say that you have 30, 40, 100 genes that all give you some likelihood to migrate. And the more of the migratory versions of those genes you have, the more likely you are to migrate. If you have enough of the migratory genes, you end up as a migrant individual. If you have too few of the migratory genes, you end up as a resident individual. Crucially, this doesn't mean that all residents here have all the resident versions and the migrants have all the migratory versions. Some of these migratory individuals could have resident genes and some of these residents could have migratory genes. In contrast, we have more kind of a major allele model. Again, this is oversimplified. Um, but essentially you could think of, let's say we have only one allele that is controlling migration. Um, if you have two copies of the resident allele, you are not migratory. If you have zero copies of the resident allele, that is two copies of the migratory allele, you are a migratory individual. And if you have one of each, you know, you're maybe somewhere between or dominant towards one side or the other. Um, so in this case, your migration is controlled by a much more discrete thing. And, and the important thing to note here is that it's much harder for genes to hide in this case. Um, if you have two of these resident alleles, you're not harboring any migratory genes. And we only see uh, resident alleles like hiding in a very small proportion of migratory individuals. Um, so wh whereas residents can have a lot of uh, migratory genes held within their gene pool in the threshold model, that's not as true when we have a few alleles with major effects on, on your migratory phenotype. So in this case, then, um, under a threshold model, we should expect to see migration come back. These individuals are still holding on to those migratory genes. Conditions change, selection pressures shift to favor migrants again. Boom, we have migrants again. Those genes are still there. They're just slightly hidden. Um, under this model, it seems less likely that we would see uh, migratory behavior come back because those migratory genes cannot hide as much in individuals that are resident. Um, so then a question we can ask is, which of these two rough categories do species that we're interested in tend to fall into? Um, so I'm gonna talk about two kinds of different models here, uh, Australian monarch butterflies and uh, massive and steelhead salmon. Um, monarch butterflies are really cool species. As I talked about before, they're enormously charismatic. I think they're probably one of the most well-known insect species in the United States and certainly the most well-liked. Um, they're gorgeous, gorgeous little beasties. Um, and they have this really charismatic and really interesting migratory behavior. Um, so they, uh, there's kind of two different subsections to this, two different life histories within the migrants. You have Western migrants and Eastern migrants. Um, Eastern migrants are particularly interesting because their southerly migration in the fall, they start up here and they come back in one step, all the way back, those are those red lines. But in the spring, when they move back north, those individuals don't do it in one step. Instead, they fly away. They find a really nice patch of milkweed. They'll stop and reproduce. Their offspring will hatch out, uh, turn into butterflies, and then they will also go farther north until they find a nice patch of milkweed and they'll stop and reproduce. Um, and they can do this three or four times. And so you have multiple generations basically recolonizing northward every year. And then they all pick up in the fall and move all the way back down to the south. So it's really interesting and cool migratory behavior. And they are sharply, sharply under decline. Um, this is just data for the Western butterflies. These ones follow a kind of more standard uh, to the coast and inland to the coast and inland every year scenario. Um, but the Eastern ones are following a, a similar track. And again, this has led to this fear that if we are selecting against migratory individuals, that we could lose those migratory uh, life histories because there are individuals in California, for example, and in Southern Florida who don't migrate at all. And a lot of these populations have a mix of both migratory and non-migratory individuals. Um, so a little bit of background here. We do know something about the genetics of migration in, in monarchs already, um, actually quite a bit about it. Uh, this is a really nice paper that came out back in 2010 uh, in Nature that looked at these old populations of, of monarchs. And monarchs we think of as a North American species and they are a North American species, but they're also in a lot of other places. Um, they're migratory here in North America. All these green dots are these migratory North American populations. They're completely non-migratory in Central and Southern America. So there's populations that live down there year round. They don't migrate. Um, there's also, I won't say introduced or invasive, but there are non-native migrants in um, Europe and Africa, as well as in the, on a bunch of Pacific islands and in Australia. So these are all non-migratory 
and the North American ones are the only migratory populations. So using this kind of uh, old evolutionary contrast between these different populations, um, this paper found a bunch of candidate loci that seem to be associated with migration in these populations. Um, one of the big most striking ones was this um, region overlying the collagen 4 gene, which collagen is really important for muscle fiber formation and other things like that that are pretty helpful if you're a migrant. Um, and this is really different between our migratory and non-migratory populations. <clears throat> um, but interestingly, they categorized Australia here as totally non-migratory. Um, and the history of the migratory population makes that make sense. So um, in Australia, this is a fairly recent colonization. They started about 1840, so 160 years ago or so. Um, and they spread there from North America. And interestingly, they weren't spread there by us, as far as we know, they spread there themselves. So we uh, moved milkweed, which is a major host plant, to Hawaii and to a bunch of other places where we introduced it. And then my uh, monarchs were blown across during probably big storm events to end up on Hawaii and then blown further across the Pacific and kind of stepping stoned their way across the Pacific. And to me, it's frankly pretty amazing that you could have a little butterfly that's migrating way up here that gets blown all the way to Hawaii. But I guess it probably had been happening for millions of years. And once we had milkweed on there, there was something for them to survive and reproduce on. Um, so yeah, over the last 160 years or so, we've established these monarch populations and all these islands by themselves. And the interesting thing is, and I should stress here first, that this work was done in very tight collaboration with Mika Friedman, who's now at the University of uh, Chicago, and Marin Zaluki, who is at the uh, University of Queensland. And the really interesting thing about these populations is that although they are migratory here in North America, they're non-migratory in all these islands. And that's not to say they don't have migration genes on those islands, but you don't exactly get a lot of day length change or temperature changes in Hawaii. And so the monarchs there never get the cues that tell them to migrate that they would get in North America. Um, <clears throat> same deal on the majority of these islands, but in Australia and New Zealand, they have observed migratory behavior. Um, so in those areas, they tend to have a pretty different directionality than here, which maybe isn't too surprising. Um, but they will uh, winter up in the north in Queensland, New South Wales, and then they will summer farther down south and inland. So they have a flipped uh, orientation to their migration where they fly, and I always have to think through this carefully to make sure I don't want to say it. They fly south for the summer and north for the winter. So the reverse of our directions, which southern hemisphere, that should make sense to us. Um, but the really crucial thing is that if we look at populations around here in Queensland, these individuals from here, they are uh, non-migratory. So we can look at totally non-migratory populations. But if you take individuals from there and you raise them under conditions that would induce migration, like declining day lengths and um, decreasing temperatures, some individuals, not all, but some will display migratory behavior. Um, and another interesting thing to note that I forgot is that um, they'd started displaying this migratory behavior about 50 years after getting to Australia. So when they first got there, there was no migration, just like on the Pacific Islands. And then they'd started displaying that about 50 years later. Um, since monarchs have about seven generations per year when they are non-migratory, we're looking at something like 350 generations of monarchs before they were observed migrating again. Um, so myself and my collaborators um, in 2016 and 18 went to Australia and we collected a bunch of monarch butterflies and raised them under those conditions that should induce migration. And what we observed is that there was a really strong bias between families um, as to the degree of migratory response those families had. So some families had many, many individuals that had a strong migratory response, um, but most families had very little migratory response. And this was significantly biased amongst migration. The p-value for this was like 0.001 or something. Um, so what this looks like to me then is that when we have migration biased by family or by relatedness, it seems likely that there's probably some heritability for this trait. So this trait is heritable. There's probably some genetic elements that are contributing to it. It's not guaranteed, but it seems very likely. Um, and note that we did raise these families under identical conditions and they were mixed up individuals in different um, raising plates and stuff. So those kinds of plate effects are unlikely to be as big of an issue here. Um, so we are left with a situation where it looks like there's some genetic control of migratory behavior in Australia. Um, 
despite coming from this like long lineage of highly bottlenecked teeny little island populations um, from some distantly migratory ancestors. That gives us kind of two hypotheses for how they started migrating again in Australia after hundreds of generations with no migration. Um, <clears throat> the first hypothesis is that they control their migration in Australia by uh, old variation. So the same ways that they control or make that decision to migrate in North America. Um, the hypothesis with this would be that in North America, they are fully migratory on these islands uh, across the Pacific on their way to Australia. They kept, they held onto the migratory variation, but they didn't display migration. So they're all non-migratory, but that variation is still there. The genetic elements that say migrate. Remember that they're not expressed there because they don't ever see the environmental cues that would tell them to migrate. And then they get to Australia and those migratory elements are selected up in frequency again. And we see that trait reemerge. Um, the biggest problem with this again is they're strongly bottlenecked as they step across the Pacific Islands. So on Hawaii, we estimated an introduction size of somewhere around 100 individuals, which is probably an overestimate and probably a vast overestimate. And I would expect similar numbers on all of these islands as they step and stone their way across. So the amount of genetic variation in these populations during their sub, uh, sub, subsequent establishment should be really low. So it seems remarkable to me that we held on to this variation where we had both non-migratory and migratory genetics in these individuals. The other hypothesis is that this is new variation. So migratory in North America. On these islands, they're totally non-migratory. They lose the migratory variants because of repeated bottlenecks. They get to Australia and new mutations arise that enable migration. Now, the problem with this is also pretty obvious. These kinds of complicated frameworks and complicated behavioral suites that allow for migration, um, those aren't simple to just re-evolve by, by mutation. Like That seems like a fairly low probability occurrence, um, but it has to have been one of these two as far as we can tell. Um, so to try and investigate this and figure out which of these things happened, uh, again, we went to Australia, uh, sampled a bunch of monarchs from sites that look like this. These are their host plant milkweed. Um, we sampled these right about here uh, in, in the far south of Queensland, uh, raised individuals under environmental conditions that should cause them to migrate. So we modeled our conditions off of what a, a monarch butterfly would experience in southern British Columbia in September. Um, so sharply declining day lengths and temperatures. Um, we raised them like that from egg till adult butterfly. Um, we then phenotype them for migratory behavior. If you're interested in that, we specifically used reproductive diapause or uh, pausing their reproductive development. Migrant individuals do not develop uh, into reproductively mature individuals until they reach their destination. Um, if you're interested in that, we have pictures and things of the egg development, um, but that's how we phenotype them for some kind of migratory response. We then did RAD sequencing, restric restriction site associated uh, digest DNA sequencing. Essentially, I'm realizing this has typos in it now. Thanks, Wikipedia. Um, essentially, what that means is that we sequence individuals from a lot of uh, random locations throughout the genome. And we did this with enough density that we have a pretty good look at the whole genome of monarch butterflies to scan for anything that is associated with our migratory phenotype. So we look at all these different sites we've sequenced and we look at each possible locus and we see, do we tend to see one allele or the other in our migratory individuals, but not in our others? Um, and what we found is that we did in fact find some associations. Um, if you've not seen these kinds of plots before, this is called the Manhattan plot because this looks, if you really squint, kind of like a Manhattan skyline with a bunch of skyscrapers. Um, these plots on the x-axis have the position of each of the alleles, each of the loci that we sequenced um, along the entire genome. So we have chromosome one, two, three, four, all the way up to chromosome 30. And within each of these chromosomes, this is the first base pair in that chromosome, the first position to the last position. And on the y-axis here, we have the negative log 10 p-value. So a higher p-value means that alleles at that site were more significantly associated with migration. And note that this is like highly significant. This level would be uh, p-value 0. 0.000001, give or take. Uh, but there's a lot of loci that we sequence, so we have a fairly high threshold. What we look for is multiple loci all right next to each other that are all highly associated with migration. If we see something like this, where there's one highly associated locus with nothing close to it, that's more likely to be noise. If we see um, multiple loci all really close to each other that are all associated with migration, it's more likely that those are all representing some true underlying gene that is actually associated with migratory behavior. 
Um, and we, so we found one candidate loci here on chromosome 11. There's a couple of other possible candidates that we need to look into more, but the strongest candidate is here on chromosome 11. Um, so we were able to identify the genes that are under this location. The question is, are these the same genes that are observed in North America? Remember that this study found this collagen 4 gene was strongly differentiated, um, but they also found about a suite of another 500 or so genes that were also associated. I'm sorry, I misspoke 150 genes. Um, was our gene one of those? No. The gene that we found underlying this, none of these genes that they found highly associated with migration in these North American old migratory populations was associated with migration in um, Australia. Um, what was associated was this gene here, um, which is a homologue for a gene in silkworms. We don't know much about this gene in monarch butterflies, um, but we do know something, just something about it in silkworms. We know that in silkworms, this gene is associated with larval stage transitions. So this gene is differentially expressed when individuals are moving through their different larval instars during their development. Interestingly, there is a hormone that controls those transitions it's called juvenile hormone. And juvenile hormone is also what controls the onset of reproductive development in monarch butterflies. And if you remember I mentioned earlier, reproductive development is the phenotype we use to assess are these individuals migratory. So this makes really good sense that this gene could be the one that controls migration in Australia. And it's very interesting that it's different. Where does that lead these two hypotheses? Well, it's actually kind of hard to tell. Um, with this alone, it's still possible that this allele is associated with migration in North America, but that these other studies did not pick it up. Um, and that could be because it's part of a threshold response gene where this has a small enough effect on North America, in North America that we did never pick it up but it is taking on more of that role in Australia, or it could be a new mutation. Um, either way, it, this looks more like we have at least one major effect allele on migration, and yet we still saw the recovery of the migratory behavior in Australia after hundreds of generations with no migration, um, either by new mutation or the somehow this like slight maintenance of these old migratory genes. Um, so it's a really interesting scenario, and I think it really serves to highlight how complex this whole picture is. Um, more work is needed on it, but it's, it's a start. Um, we do have some whole genome sequencing that we have prepped to hopefully get a better picture of things. Um, <clears throat> so conclusions here for this first part, migration in Australia and monarch butterflies is uses a potentially different pathway than we observe in North America. That could be a new mutation. Um, note that it was probably selectively neutral on all of those islands. And so it could have been maintained across those islands without selection acting against it and just somehow to survive that drift bottleneck. Um, or it could again be, and part of the reason that we didn't observe it in North America is being important is because it's part of a threshold response. Um, but one definite conclusion is that it seems like in Australia, at least, the loss of migration in monarch butterflies was rapidly reversed by evolution, which is really interesting and promising for North America. Um, even if we see migration go quasi-extinct in North American monarch butterflies, at least we have one example of a case where that happened somewhere else and it came right back. Um, so to contrast this now, we're gonna talk about steelhead, um, something that a lot of you are way more familiar with about monarchs, I assume. Um, and I'm gonna go at this at a very surface level. Um, so, you, so a lot of you probably know more detail about this than I'm gonna go into, um, but I'm gonna present it kind of a more surface level to make this contrast clearer. Um, to start off with, steelhead, uh, many populations of steelhead have both resident individuals that we call rainbow trout and anadromous individuals that we call steelhead. Um, and body size as juveniles seems to be really important to the decision to migrate. Those individuals that have low body size, like there's two different pathways here, these individuals that have low body sizes that don't grow very well when they are young individuals, those individuals tend to be more likely to migrate because um, if they're really small and they haven't found enough food, you may as well try and find you know, better eats in the ocean. Um, individuals that are really large, those individuals, um, why would you bother leaving if you've managed to grow so good in the river system? Um, so that seems to be an important part of this picture. And interestingly, growth rates during development are influenced to a decent degree by one large haplotype that's on OMY5. Um, I've heard talk that this may be a double chromosomal inversion for those of you who are interested, um, but it's that seems to be contribute in at least some part to growth rates. Um, that allows us to start building up some kind of a simple model of migration of that migra migratory decision in steelhead. Are your conditions really, really good? Then everybody's resident. Um, 
or on alternatively, can you not get to the ocean and everybody's resident? But if your conditions are really good, everybody's resident, even if you have the slower growth rate genes, you still grow really well and you don't bother going to the ocean. Under medium conditions, that gene becomes really important. Um, if you have the fast, growth, the fast growth rate variant, you're much more likely to be resident. Um, and if you have the slow growth rate genes, you're still more likely, you're much more likely to be a migrant, anadromous individual. Note that there's some crossover here. You can have an individual with the fast growth rate gene who can't find a bite to eat anyway. They have really bad luck, they starve, they <laughs> go to the ocean to find better luck. Uh, you can also have a slow growth gene individual who finds a McDonald's there, chows down, ends up becoming a resident individual. So there's some crossover here, but there is an influence of genetics we would expect under these kinds of medium conditions. Under really bad environmental conditions, we would be more likely to suspect that everybody's anadromous, right? Um, doesn't matter if you have fast or slow growth rate genes, you're in bad shape, you're gonna head to the ocean um, to try and get larger. In massive salmon, there are salmon species that I suspect most of us aren't as familiar with, and that's because they're not in North America. Um, they live on the Kamchatka Peninsula, and they also live coast of China and Japan, um, all the way down to South Korea a little bit. Um, this species also has two different life histories. They have resident and they have anadromous individuals, um, and it's heavily sex biased in Massey. So the females are virtually all anadromous. There's a handful of females that will be resident um, depending on the conditions, but almost all females go to the ocean. Males, it's much more fluid. Uh, males are neither anadromous or resident. Many male individuals will breed multiple times in the streams as resident individuals and then decide to go to the ocean um, and then come back and breed one more time. Um, so there's a lot of fluidity there and proportions are often fairly even depending on where you look. So there's a lot of my anadromous and a lot of resident individuals. These individuals freely interbreed with each other. So you'll have anadromous individuals breeding with residents and vice versa all the time. Um, their migration seems to be, that decision to migrate or not in the male seems to be really temperature dependent. If they had warmer water temperatures during their early development, they're much more likely to um, mature in the streams and choose not to go to the ocean. If it's colder, they often tend to go straight to the ocean instead. Um, and this is probably actually the function of this is probably mediating growth rates. Um, there's studies to show that as your temperature gets warmer, you grow more quickly, which leads you to be more migratory. If your temperatures are colder, you grow more slowly, um, and you're more likely to be a migratory individual. So it probably is growth rate that's actually meeting, mediating this, but this has an effect of temperature being a really important decider on growth rate, which then decides migration. Um, so let's see if we can build a simple migration model in Massey. Under warm conditions, everybody's resident, right? You grow really well, you're resident. Under cold conditions, everybody's anadromous, you don't grow very fast, you go to the ocean. Under medium conditions, we don't know what's going on here. We don't know if there's any fast growth genes or not. Um, so is this entirely environmental, like lucky ones go to the ocean, or lucky ones stay resident and unlucky ones go to the ocean? Or are there genes that are influencing that decision? We don't really know in Massey. Um, so we've done some work recently, and a big shout out to my three collaborators here. Um, we have Itsuro uh, Koizumi, who is from Hokkaido University, Isa Saglam, who is from, um, he's right now in uh, Turkey, and we have Audrey Deng, who is an undergraduate, who's been working with me on this stuff for about two years, and she's actually the first author on this paper, which I'm really excited about. Um, but these three have done the majority of this work, and I have done some of it. Um, so <clears throat> we sampled uh, a bunch of Massey from actually quite a few different streams, all on the island of Hokkaido, which is the North Island in Japan. Hokkaido, by the way, is quite cold. It gets a lot of snow in the winter. It's a cold environment. Um, we sampled individuals from these two streams specifically for this study. Uh, these two streams have about a 50-50 ratio of migrants to non-migrants in their resident males, or sorry, in their male individuals. Um, so we sampled individuals from those two streams. Um, same plan, we did restriction site associated digest um, to then do genome wide association to see if there's any associations anywhere in the genome with migratory behavior, and we found nothing. Um, so this is that same kind of plot as before. We have the chromosomal positions, genome positions on the x-axis, association on the y-axis. Note there's no strong patterns here. There's nothing that is as significant as we saw in monarch butterflies. And we also don't see any of these more significant ones having any nearby loci that are also significant. So the pattern really isn't strong here. There's no clear associations with migration whatsoever. Um, so if this result holds up, we would have this model here. Um, warm, everybody's resident. Cold, everybody's anatomist. Medium, did you have good luck? Were you able to feed well? You're a resident. 
If you have bad luck where you're not able to feed well, you're a migrant. Um, we don't know the details here yet, but that seems to be the simple model. Um, the conclusions we can draw from this is that the residency in anadromy and steelhead is pretty complicated, but the decision genes don't always have an effect. Um, so in steelhead, we know that there are some kinds of decision genes, but under certain environmental conditions, those decision genes get overwritten. Um, this is a case of what we call G by E, that's gene by environment interactions. So it depends on the interaction of those two things. What that means is that in steelhead, anatomy genes could hide in resident populations. If we lose all of our migratory steelhead, which at this point does not seem likely, um, if we were to though, we should expect that uh, anatomy could come back um, because it could be massed in individuals that are otherwise migratory. Um, in MASU, it seems like our evidence at least suggests that uh, residency in anatomy might be solely environment. We weren't able to find any genetic effects of this. Um, <clears throat> we need to do more looking at this. Uh, remember, we only looked at two streams right here. Their range is enormous. And it could be that here the temperature and conditions and such make that gene not matter, but maybe it really matters if you're down here or up here. So we need to do more looking, but at least it seems in our populations, there's no strong evidence that genetics influences that decision. Um, what that means is that there's no decision genes to select out. Selection can't act against the decision to migrate there if there's no genes that it can act on. And what that means again is that we should see migration come right back if we change the conditions. So right now, maybe we're losing anadromous individuals uh, more frequently. Um, and we say we reduce the fitness on that such that migratory individuals have zero fitness. If the fitness came back, we would expect to see individuals making that decision again based on the same environmental conditions, and we should see that behavior once again. Um, <clears throat> again, note that we only looked at one place so far, and note that also this is simplified, right? I've only talked about these decision genes. There are other genes that could be that are migratory genes. Um, so let's say we have a population that loses migration entirely. Even if the decision genes are still there, if drift makes the enabling genes like growing well or orienting um, get broken, if those decision, if uh, selection changes, those decision genes come back into play, migratory individuals won't survive because they don't have the genes that enable that migratory behavior. So if we lose migration for long enough, we, will, we should lose it in everything. It won't just come back quickly if we uh, allow drift to act on these kinds of enabling genes. Regardless, we have a really complex picture of migration control across all of our different taxa that we've talked about here, um, from Masu to steelhead to modern butterflies. Um, and there's no reason to suspect that things are any less complex in other taxa. So it is really important if you're considering trying to conserve or manage populations that are migratory, and you're concerned about the loss of the migratory behaviors or life histories, that you have a decent understanding of it in that species. You can't just generalize. Um, so we, yeah, we need to figure out the specifics for other species as well. Um, so that's all I've got here. Again, big thanks to my, all of my different co-authors. They've been really influential and helpful in all of this. Uh, I think I have to click off my laser pointer. There we go. Um, and then thanks to the graduate group in ecology that I'm about to graduate from and from all of my collaborators at UC Davis. And that's all I've got. I am ready for questions. Thank you so much, Will. I appreciate it. And um, yeah, it's a complex story that you were telling us. And so you did a good job, I think, of parsing that out. For folks that are online, feel free to put any questions into the chat. Um, Michael, do you have anything you want to kick us off with? Any questions that you are curious about? Yes, I, uh, thank you. So, Will, I was fascinated by your mention that in Australia, the monarch butterflies, if I remember correctly, migrate in the opposite way. Mm -hmm. They do, yeah. Do you have a hypothesis for what that might be? Because I, I do if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a lot of hypotheses people have talked about with this. Um, they use a range of things to orient. Um, they use light polarization seems to be the major one. And if I understand correctly, the light polarization should still work down there to go in the opposite directions. I don't know that they use much magnetoreception. I don't think that's been found to any large extent, but that is an area of really active ongoing research as to how they managed to flip that orientation so quickly. Do you have a, if you have an hypothesis, I'd be glad to hear it. Well, I, I just, I, 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 it was a fascinating thing is I learned more and more about this with Renee's study. And, and you know, I go to the Southern Hemisphere, that's where I was born and I, I've lived here for half my life. And I've just made that transition as, uh, again. Mm 
And what is fascinating about uh, electromagnetic waves on the Earth is they they do opposite things in the different hemispheres. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I, I guess that may be a reason, I mean, you just said you don't think they use EM waves, but if they did, they may have not calibrated to you know, change their response by 180 degrees because yeah. of that. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's interesting because the change in orientation isn't straight 180 degrees. They don't, their migration there isn't straight north south in a lot of the individuals. They go more from coastal areas to interior areas. Mm. So it is slightly north south, but it's also a lot of like east west migration there. Um, so it's, I think there's got to be some different mechanisms that they're using to orient there. Yeah. Um, and I think that's probably part of why, even if these genes had persisted across their expansion, why it took so long for migratory populations to really be observed there is that they also had to deal with. Um, orientation issues. So yeah, it's, it's a really interesting thing in there that I think is right for further study. Um, any other questions online? Feel free to put them into the chat. Um, well, I was curious and I don't, my question isn't clearly formed, so forgive me, but I was thinking about resilience. Um, between these two different types of mechanisms. And I know that it might be different for each of the different species, but um, can you talk a little bit more about what we might be seeing with resilience? Yeah, so I mean, it's, um, I think that's really the big question is can these things, these different taxa spring back if we have this disturbance? Um, and it's trying to forecast the like demographic outcomes for these populations that are under selection and see if we have some certain rates of fixed rates of environmental change in the population that's migratory, can they adapt quickly enough to stay migratory is um, a really challenging problem. Um, I actually, that's the other half of my PhD is talking about that. Um, and so if you're interested in that, feel free to come to my exit seminar virtually tomorrow. <laughs> um, but it's essentially there's, it's, it's a really difficult thing to try and, and it really depends on the kind of the, the architecture of the trait under selection. If you have a trait that is really, really polygenic, that a lot of genes contribute to a trait, like what time do you leave for migration, for example, um, that will respond really differently to selection than a trait that has only a few alleles. Um, that control that. So even if you have that equation P equals G or uh, P equals G plus E, even if the proportions of G and E, the relative impacts of genetics and environment are the same, the response of the population can be really, really different depending on how that G part is portioned out across the genome. Um, so it's, it's really one of those questions where I think you have to look in each taxa to try to determine how resilient things will be to changes in stuff like migratory pressure or any other selective pressure. Um, I think for monarchs and migration, at least, the Australian example is pretty good that we can be confident that they have some capacity to spring back if they lose that migratory behavior. And if nothing else, um, if we were to lose migration in North American monarchs, um, we have a source of migratory monarch alleles in Australia. Um, a lot of the orientation things and stuff might be borked, but you know, mm -hmm. we have some of those decision genes there that we potentially harvest. So I'm very confused butterflies. <laughs> yes. <laughs> nice. Um, so I'm not sure if you can see the chat, but we ha do have a comment that you did a great job communicating this complex research um, and wanted and was encouraged by the Western Monarch results that you showed um, yeah, and said good luck for your talk tomorrow. I was wondering if you do have access to the chat, could you, if you're willing, can you put your contact information in there? So if folks have further questions or they want to talk to you more, sure. um, they have a way to get a hold of you. Yeah, I can do that. Okay. Um, Thank you for that, Will. Um, Michael, as he's doing that, any other questions that you wanted to follow up with? Yeah, and I see there's something here from Scott that just came through. Uh, but I'll ask mine while somebody else reads that. Um, 
So in the Masu study that you have this paper coming out, are, are you planning to look at populations from the further north and further south? And related to that, um, is the density of your red seek that you used in Monarch the same as what you did in um, Masu? Yeah, so we, uh, for the first thing, I really would like to look at some of those more northerly and southerly populations. It looks like this was Scott who asked this. Hi, Scott, it's been a long time. Um, yeah, there's definitely benefit to looking at those. Like, like you said, the picture of that double inversion on OMI5 in steelhead is complicated and the selection pressures on it are really different depending on which population you're looking at. And the effect of it varies as you go north to south. Um, mm. So looking at that in mass, it would be really, really nice to see if we're just in an area where the genetic elements that are decision genes just don't show up um, or aren't important. Um, so I think right now, the way this paper sits, we're gonna publish with what we've got because my undergrad is finishing and we mm -hmm. wanna have a paper for her for her CV. But next steps would be to sample more individuals, um, yeah. undoubtedly. Um, and then what was the second part of that question? Oh, the marker density. Yeah, we used um, PSC1 restriction enzyme in both cases. Um, that is a, uh, I believe that on averages gives you one cut site every, just every thousand base pairs. Um, so it's fairly high density and we use the same, the same, um, same one for both of our sets. Okay. So yeah. high, high density in both cases, um, which resulted in a lot of SNPs for both of those cases. Yeah. Our Monarch one had 200,000 and our Masu one had like double that in terms of markers because uh -huh. Masu have a much larger genome. Um, but I think there could, it's still entirely like possible that we could miss things because of that. Um, the LD block size in these populations is not, not that small. So we should be getting at least something associated with it. Um, but I would like to do whole genome. We have a couple of plates of whole genome sequencing for the monarchs that are sitting in the sequencing queue with, at the genome center right now. And hopefully we'll find out more about that in a couple of weeks. Um, but I think more massive from more places and probably whole genome on them would help us make sure that we're not just missing something. Well, Scott has a question here I'd like you to get to, but I can't help but uh, add to that, that you just raised an interesting thought. So are monarchs, do they have a duplicated genome? Do not you? like the, not like some monarchs. <laughs> yeah, so that's another really interesting thing about the assay really, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so the monarchs have, or uh, uh, some monarchs have their ancestral like teleost duplication and then another ancestral salmonid duplication which makes everything hard <laughs> in Simon. Um, so yeah, the other thing that we thought about for Masu is we could have something like copy number variation um, that is controlling this that we just wouldn't pick up. Mm. Um, and again, I think doing whole genome sequencing would probably help with that because there's some slightly different methods you can use with that. Um, and also probably doing some more controlled um, parentage studies. We know that there's not a strong degree of heritability of migration in these populations, which also suggests that it's probably not super likely that there's any genetic elements, obvious mm. ones that are missing yeah. in these populations, but it could be something like copy number variation. We just can't pick up um, partially because of complications and the tetrasomic stuff. So, I mean, yeah. And Scott's question kind of builds a little bit on uh, sample location. And um, Scott was asking if the population is isolated upstream of natural waterfalls. They've seen in other um, oh my kiss populations that um, things are different if they're selected for if they're an isolated population. Yeah, definitely. So that um, the uh, association plot I showed of the um, OMY5 gene that was from my advisor's paper from 10 years ago. Um, and they use those kinds of isolated populations for that one, I believe. Um, there are those populations in, in uh, Masu that are wholly resident. Um, you also have wholly migratory populations in different places. Um, so I think that would also probably be a really profitable way to look for, at least for differences in selected pressures against residents versus migrants. Um, so yeah, definitely there's a lot to do with that. Um, and if you're interested in that, 
email it to because he is like he's the massive guy <laughs> and i just see that will also added his zoom link for tomorrow i believe is what yep. i see in the chat so if you want to um review a little bit of this and learn a little bit more maybe dig in a little bit deeper you can join will for his defense tomorrow um, and if there's no other questions, I think on that note, um, you're getting good job, uh, good luck tomorrow, uh, hand claps coming in on chat, Will, but I think we'll um, let you off the hook for today. Sounds um, good. <laughs> for I'll everybody. I'll go quietly stress out. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully we kept you busy for an hour um, and yep. occupied so you couldn't stress. For everybody online, I hope you join us next week. Thank you so much for being here. Once again, thank you so much, Will, for taking time yeah, to be with thank us. Thank you, Will. It was thank great having me sure it was a pleasure you're very welcome all right everybody we'll see you next time bye, bye. Now.